Atomic research is a process that was developed to allow knowledge to be organised in a way that allows evidence, ideas and decisions to be shared, reused across an organisation. The solution ended up being fundamentally a useful way to think about and synthesise information. So my name is Daniel Pidcock and I'm the creator of Atomic Research uh, and the founder of Gleanly, a knowledge repository built around the atomic process. Um, I've been a UX designer and researcher for about 18 years now and I've worked with large brands such as Just Eat, Clarks, Honda and the Royal Navy, um, as well as startups and scale-ups. So I've seen a great deal of different teams and projects, almost all suffering from lack of institutional memory. Uh, and what I mean by that is most organizations don't know what they know. Teams do research to answer questions, and that information is rarely available for the rest of the organization. And even in the same team, they quite often forget what they already know. So this leads to a lot of wasted time, relearning the same things again and again, and often making the same mistakes again and again. And this is before we consider how much opportunity is being missed. So the trigger that made me confront this problem head on is when I uh, founded the accessibility team at a large tech company. And like most organizations I'd worked at before, all of their knowledge was being stored as reports. And these were often kept in shared drives, but even with tagging and search tools, we often couldn't find what we already knew existed. So we knew we were losing a great deal. So it, if it was hard to find a report, it was even harder to search the contents of those documents without downloading and interrogating each one. And this became even more of an issue when we started the accessibility project, because it's rare to have a study done on accessibility specifically. So usually research on accessibility would be part of a wider project. So we'd literally thousands of reports to um, crawl through. So then even if we found something useful, reports contained a lot of context. So when we extracted the insights, that context was lost. So the problem and objectives we had for this is uh, what we wanted to be able to do is have the ability to have insights that can live outside of report, but maintain a connection to the evidence. So we wanted something that was easy to understand and for non-research, especially um, decision makers um, to be able to, um, to use. And we needed to work at scale. So across the whole organiz organization, no matter their department, discipline or any other factor. So this was a big challenge to solve. And like most UX professionals, my first inclination was to break things down. Um, so break down the problem into bite-sized pieces. And this also happened to be the solution to the problem. So breaking knowledge down into its atomic elements. So working with people inside that company and other organizations, um, we developed and finessed a simple, powerful process that can work with any type of knowledge in almost any situation. So um, atomic research is now used by thousands of teams across the world and some of the biggest brands, and but then also individual researchers. Um, all different industries, mostly UX and user research um, and product design, but it can work with anything that is evidence led. The weirdest one we've ever had at Gleanly was a team that deals with murder investigations. So why do many people find this process useful? Well, for synthesis, it reduces personal bias, or at least you can split your personal bias from the findings you've learnt. Um, it very much encourages retesting, so recommendations come back around um, to experiments. And it forces you to think about the why, often leading to more innovative solutions. Um, and that thinking about the why is one of the most powerful, it's quite simple, but such a powerful part of it. So it gives a good framework for non-researchers as well. So it's very easy to follow for people who haven't got research um, training. But for those that are trying to build a repository, it allows scale with low management. So this is what it was designed to achieve, right? Um, we get a holistic view of all the evidence from the whole organization and beyond. Um, the evidence for and against, which is really important. 
Um, a lot of uh, research repositories or reports quite often ignore the evidence against um, why we should do something. So give a really holistic view, allows people to make um, better decisions. Um, and it allows us to move quickly with confidence, uh, encourages collaboration and smooths out tagging issues. As much as Atomic is, I think is wonderful, it's not a silver bullet that's gonna solve everything. So the main challenge is it requires a change in the process, not the tools or methods that are used to create the knowledge or even the initial analysis, but the secret to better understanding findings and delivering it in a format that can be shared um, un and understood and built upon by the whole organization starts at the synthesis stage. So the reason this can be a challenge is it requires engagement. You can do your research and produce reports and then break it down into the atomic process afterwards, but this is painful and it takes extra effort. So we'll talk about engagement later specifically, but keep in mind, if you're the only person that's using this process, you'll probably find it useful um, or at least a useful tool to, um, to better understand what you've learned and deliver better recommendations. But if you want to build a shared single source of truth, you will need your colleagues and other people doing research to buy in and engage in the process too. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, it requires a change in the way you think. Um, I find most tools and processes are focused on helping the researcher and helping our lives, uh, make our lives easier. Instead, what I ask you to think about is why we're doing this and who we're doing it for. We're here to discover, organize, and deliver knowledge for decision makers. And it might be that sometimes we are also the decision maker in this situation, but for most, there are other stakeholders and uh, people that are involved. So we're here, and the Atomic Research Process is here to help people make better decisions. So I've already mentioned, but many people were involved in helping me define this process. I particularly want to give a shout out to David Yates, who gave me the original spark of the idea of atomization. Um, Atoma Sharon has been a big thinker in this space and generally a wonderful person, so deserves a great deal of credit. And of course, uh, a great deal of inspiration came from Brad Frost and his atomic design process. So if you haven't heard of it, atomic design allows you to break down a piece of UI into its atomic parts. Um, you know, all items are made out of these basic shapes and colors and text. These create atoms that can be brought together to create molecules. Um, and those can form organisms until we have an entire website, app or whatever. So the similarity with what we were trying to achieve with knowledge was stark here. And hence the nod to the process in the atomic research name. So atomic research is a deceptively simple process with four distinct parts or atoms that create molecules of knowledge. So it starts with experiments. This is what we did to discover the knowledge. And this can be anything from a large scale study to simply overhearing something on a bus. But it gives us context for the facts. And facts are what we learned. A good fact is a quote, an observation or statistic, but it's never our opinion. Whereas insights are our opinion of why the facts are the way they are. And this is often the cause or the effect of the evidence, the connection between the fact and the recommendation. So recommendations are what we think we should do with this knowledge, the actionable result of what's come before. And most recommendations are testable, which creates new experiments and the cycle continues. And this is the secret to creating a scalable knowledge repository, with, which both retains the what and the why decisions were made, and importantly, what happened after. So each of these atoms connect together to create a molecule of knowledge. And now actually, a lot of people call this a nugget due to the great work that Thomas Sharon did, who I mentioned earlier. But that simple process becomes really powerful when you see it from the perspective of each of those elements. So what we're seeing here is a molecule or nugget from the perspective of a fact. And this is usually the perspective we use when creating knowledge and synthesizing our findings. A fact always belongs to an experiment because that's how it was learnt and that's intrinsic to the fact but a fact can be connected to many insights. And this is great because we might have several ideas of what the evidence is telling us. We don't need to argue about one idea. We can think broadly and explore lots of reasons. 
it's also important that we can connect negatively to an insight. And that's what this red, um, this red dashed line represents. This fact is evidence for these insights and against this insight. So this is the perspective of an insight. You can see the, the insight is connected to lots of facts across several experiments, uh, and both have evidence that both supports and disproves our theory. But we can also see it's connected to several recommendations. So once again, we can have lots of ideas springing from one insight. Now I like to synthesize my research with my cross-functional team and having the ability to have a range of ideas is really wonderful. So I'm from a design background, so I tend to be biased towards solving problems uh, with UI solutions. But a database analyst would likely to have innovative ideas that have never occurred for me. And there may be other people in the team that have a, a broad range of backgrounds and ideas um, that they can bring to the table. So this tends to be the view that other researchers find useful. I'm most interested in what you learnt and the evidence behind each insight. But perhaps I'm less interested but curious about what you're going to do next. Whereas this view is the view that stakeholders and decision makers love. We want to be able to show them the recommendation along with the thinking or insights that led to this idea and then the evidence that supports each of those insights. And we're able to show them a holistic view that makes it clear what evidence we have for and against and allow them to make informed decisions. So stakeholders can understand the evidence at the level that makes sense for them. They can scan the insights and glance at the evidence or really go deep on, into each experiment, get an in-depth understanding of how facts were learned. And that's great for, for us as researchers that we only need to share one molecule and the stakeholder can self-manage the level of detail they prefer. So we did um, uh, some research a while back and we discovered that the people using this method, it was reducing reporting by up to 80%. So let's talk about tools. The most simple and obvious way to get started is with good old sticky notes, either physically or using a tool like Miro digitally. And this is how I began testing the process within teams. And I see many people still use this for the initial affinity mapping and synthesis. And you can see here on this uh, photo that we, we actually affinity mapped the findings on the top third, and the next level is insights, then the bottom level is recommendations. And we simply drew connections with a whiteboard marker. So this works great for group synthesis. It's very visual, it's very tactile. It can get messy if you have lots of research, especially if you've got something at one end of the board you wanna to connect to the opposite side of the board. So it's great for physical, but not so great for storage and for sharing. But I still see a lot of people starting in Miro and then maybe exporting into their repository tool of choice afterwards. So Airtable was the first tool we moved to to try and create a repository out of this. So this is a lot better for remote teams and anyone can access it. Um, insights and recommendations were set up as tags so they could be easily reused and it's very easy to see which were the most common. The issue we had with this, it was quite limited in scale, very easy to break, maybe not all that approachable for non-researchers either. Um, but that said, there's a few Airtable bases set up that will get you started. This one is by Tom Schoen, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he set up and shared the Polaris um, Airtable base which he created as the head of research for WeWork at the time. It's really useful, but perhaps a bit focused on WeWork specific needs. Um, it's got lots of uh, different sections like provocations and journeys and all sorts of things, which maybe complicate things a little bit for first time users. I actually think this one by Martin Guillaume at uh, Devo team is actually a little bit more approachable. So they're using this with their consultancy clients and have kindly shared it for other people to benefit from. Ultimately, we tested many products to try and find something that ticked all the boxes, but it became clear we needed a dedicated tool um, built around atomic research. So there was a few things we wanted to be able to achieve, which we couldn't work out how to do with off the shelf tools. For example, being able to switch the view from fact first to insight or recommendation first. But that said, you don't need to use a tool like Gleamly or any other specific tool to do the things we're talking about today. But if you did want to give it a go, Design Shop members can get free access using code DS100. So with that in mind, let's have a look at a real world example. In this case, a survey. So this is based on a real world example with some details changed. Um, and it was a while back that I was supporting a customer, a fashion brand, 
that had just undertaken a survey of their customers. And one of the findings that they found was that uh, a large proportion of their um, respondents claimed to prefer the color green. And the conversation was actually about, should that be a, uh, a fact or an insight? It's the insight that um, majority of their people prefer uh, the color green. And I said, well, this is information coming from a survey. So therefore it's a fact, it's a fact that people have told us that they prefer the color green. And what would be more interesting actually would be to think about what insights we might have that we can support that with. So we might connect an insight up saying something along the lines of our branding is particularly attractive to those that prefer the color green. But we might have other ideas as well. Maybe we think it's because green is a particularly natural color or an action color. We could have all sorts of ideas. What's the cause of this? But also we can think about what's the effect? Is this, does this mean we're missing out from, of sales of people who love the color blue or the color red? Or do we have an opportunity to be the, the company that people love for green clothing? So it's really interesting when we take the, um, what some people might see as an insight, majority of our customers love the color green and move it to being a fact and start thinking about the cause and effect. Why is this happening? And what are we going to do about it? And actually, one of the first things we might want to do is actually see if there's other data that we can use to connect to this. So we have the survey saying, uh, showing that a majority of people uh, prefer the color green, but maybe they're relying. Maybe that was just the easiest button to click. Do we have any data to back this up? And in this case, we could actually look at their sales data and we saw that 44 percent. Uh, a large percentage of what they were selling fell into the green spectrum. So this was backed up with a secondary source of data. So in this case, we've got two quantitative sources of data showing that there's something going on here. What we're missing is the quality. We need to speak to some customers and find out why this is, right? Otherwise, it's all guesswork. But when we do that, we can connect that up and start building this really beautiful picture of what we know and what we don't know about our customers. One of the things we decided to do straight away in that meeting was actually swap the image on the homepage, um, an A-B test with uh, a green, uh, some green clothing. And I can't remember the actual uh, feedback from that. I spoke to them about a month or two after, and they said they had a massive uplift when they changed that, um, that, um, that picture to green. I don't remember the exact percentages. Um, but it was wonderful that that kind of little discussion about whether this should be a fact or an insight actually turned into, first of all, really quite a profitable change for them with the homepage um, uh, image change, but also um, this whole kind of journey into discovery. So earlier I mentioned how important it is to remember the, why we're doing this which is to allow us and other people to make better decisions. So let's take our time to think about and look at this from a perspective of a decision maker. So what we can see here is we want to offer free shipping on all orders. Okay, well, that's very interesting, but what's, what's the thinking behind this? So we know that users are leaving the checkout flow to find free shipping coupons, and a lot of those aren't coming back. Um, we can see that dis uh, shipping cost is a deciding factor to, to whether people are going to check out with us or not. So offering free shipping should in improve that, should increase that, right? But we've also got some um, negative connected insights here. So these may be reasons we might choose not to do this, or at least considerations um, that will help us make better quality decisions. So for instance, we can see here that if we add the shipping cost onto the onto the purchase price, onto the product price, uh, it's going to make us look uncompetitive. We're going to have to swallow that shipping cost if we want to do this properly. And it looks like there may be something happening in Italy where this might not might not work for them. Okay, well those that's all very interesting, but do I trust? Do I believe um, these insights? What's the basis for these insights? For these assertions? Well, I can see here we've got eight different experiments supporting um, this shipping cost one. And these come from all sorts of different sources. Uh, we've got um, different methods as well. So we've got user tests here. We've got some A-B tests as well. So we've got qualitative and quantitative. And I can actually read each one of these and find out what people are saying. So you can see here, you know, this person has left the flow to go and find a free shipping coupon. Uh, whereas this person says they just find the, the lowest possible price 
uh, and they hope the post isn't too much. So for this person, giving away free shipping won't really um, affect them. They probably would have become our customer otherwise. But we can see here, we've actually tested this in the real world, right? So it's so that circle. We had this idea of doing free shipping, and now we've done an A-B test in the UK to find out if that's going to work. And you can see here, conversion lifted by 6%. Um, there was an increase in cost of sales, which we would expect, right? We're swallowing that um, that shipping cost. So we're going to have, someone's going to have to pay for that. But we can see the increase in sales more than made up for that loss. So that's quite a successful test there. And we can see here, we tried it in France as well. Now, actually the shipping cost was even more, it was 150K, probably because it's a bigger country, I would, I would suspect. But maybe also because perhaps shipping is more expensive in France, uh, that also uh, lifted conversion even more and, and uh, the increase in sales was even more substantial. So that really worked. And now we can see we tried that in Italy. We can see here something's gone really wrong, right? So conversions dropped 12%. The sales value dropped. There's no significant change in the cost of sales. That's a bit confusing to me, to be honest. I'm not Italian. I've got Italian family, but I'm not aware of anything in, in Italy that would uh, that would be the source of this. So my first indication might be to check, maybe there was a problem with the test, maybe it was badly translated. Um, so I'd check those things first. Maybe we can rescue this um, this A-B test. But if that all comes back fine and we find that, a yeah, this was a solid A-B test, something is definitely different over in, in the Italian market. My next step would be to talk to some customers, get some qualitative on this and find out why is there um, uh, this change. It may be that someone would say to me, look, Dan, you wouldn't understand as a British person, but our culture here is very different and this is why it's different. And I can record those, I can connect them using this atomic method and show that understanding of why things work or don't, don't work in different markets or for different products or in different use cases for different audiences. And not only that, that's going to be shared with someone in the, everyone in the future. So someone comes along in the, um, say in a year's time, perhaps after I've left the organization and they say, look, we're doing free shipping all around Europe. Why are we not doing it in Italy? They can see why. Now they may say that's changed. I believe that the culture's changed, the world's changed. We want to retest this and that's great. So we can keep on um, retesting and adding new evidence. If we start to see evidence that uh, things have changed in Italy, we might um, change our decision on not offering free shipping there. So next, let's discuss how we can write really good quality facts, insights and recommendations. And actually, before we do that, I want to uh, approach something. I often tell people it's better to get poorly coded research into a repository than risk losing it. After all, if it's not there at all, it will never be found. So for traditional insight repositories that rely heavily on tagging and coding, this is a problem. If it's not tagged, it won't exist as far as the system's concerned. However, with Atomic, when we connect a fact to an insight or an insight to a recommendation, we're creating a relationship there, right? So you could say we're coding via stealth. So one thing I say regularly, it's one of the rare instances in this life where quantity is more important than quality. And maybe a way to think about that is if uh, putting in best practices and rules uh, make it less likely for someone to record something and therefore not make it discoverable by other people, it's worth relaxing those rules. That doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for a certain level of quality, but it's finding that balance. So this is our Atomic UX research cheat sheet. And I need to give a big shout out to Mario de Geest who did a lot of the thinking around this. Um, so this can be downloaded and kept. There's a QR code there. So experiments, as we said, this is what we did to discover the knowledge. It's also the most commonly changed terminology and changing terminology is absolutely fine by me, by the way. Um, you should use the terminology that's right for your organization and works for the people you're working with. Right. So many find the experiment is maybe perhaps a bit too formal a term and some good alternatives are study, activity or source is a good one. Um, and the job of an experiment container is to give context for the findings. So I suggest using as much detail about the experiment as possible. Uh, experiment design, prototypes, scripts, this can all come in useful. So to that end, here's some ideas around taxonomy. Experiments uh, classification should aid discovery 
and provide context for the facts to communicate how they were learnt. So we can include things like mythology, where, you know, all the product that the data came from, that the information came from, how did we learn this? What product or service or country, those kind of items is this information about? You know, the platform, if you're working on uh, in a digital space, it could be that you this were, uh, these findings were related to the web uh, website or the app, or maybe in a bricks and mortar store. What department, team or client were these related to? Also subject matter and objective. What were we trying to learn when we were doing this? Because that infers some kind of bias, right? So anything that gives me more understanding of how this information was learned. And also data is a really important one. How old is this data? Moving on to facts. So facts as a reminder of what we learned. Um, a good fact is a quote, an observation or statistic. And I've got a couple of examples there. So quote, I can't find the invoice section. Surely it should be here. An observation, participant three took six minutes total to find the invoice section and ended up in the profile settings four times. So sometimes I see facts where you can ask the question, how do you know that? So if I said the participant struggled to find the invoice section, I could ask the question, how do they know that? So it's quite good to write a fact in a way that is unbiased, that kind of someone can infer they were struggling to find the invoice section. Statistics, 14% of support calls are clients looking for copies of their invoice. So they should be unbiased. They should hold no assumptions. They should be short enough to read in a few seconds and they should have enough context to be understood by itself. And that short enough thing applies to everything from facts, insights and recommendations. They need to be bite-sized, right? If we think about the people who are going to be consuming this information, they need to be able to look at a fact and understand what that person was saying or what that person did or what the statistic um, information, the statistic holds. So what happens if you have a really long fact? Now, the, sometimes that is the case that you want to be able to break that down into separate parts. Maybe they're talking for a long time. And within that, we can summarize that down into a very simple line of that person really loves their dog or their cat or their pet. But they may be in that conversation actually saying lots of small, interesting bits. We might want to divide those up. This is atoms. Remember, we're atomizing these findings. So you have to take a view on that. One thing to be cautious of, though, is if we are summarizing a long thing that someone said is we need to be careful. We're not going to introduce bias in there. If we say oh, this person spoke at length about how much they love their pets. OK, well, is that what they said? Is that our inference of what they said? So we have to be careful about that. So let's talk about taxonomy. So the experiment tells us how it was learnt, i.e. moderated user tests, but the facts need to tell us who told us, the individual or the specific um, uh, information to do with that atom. So we might, want, um, uh, we might want clues about their demographics or their sentiment at the time they were saying it. Where were they in the journey of the product or uh, in a physical location at the time? Or for quant data, things like the date range and the factors that allow us to be able to reproduce that data and see it for ourselves. So some of this may be included in the fact itself, so it might not need to have a separate taxonomy, but it does not it does no harm to have a good structure in place. Some ideas for that would be source, demographic persona, sentiment, journey, things that help people have a better understanding of that fact. So now to insights. So an insight should try and include the context, the cause and the effect of the evidence. So example here, the customer can't find invoice section in the footer because they see invoices related to their personal paid account rather than the product. That's the cause of what we believe to be the cause. And the effect is they end up calling the contact center for help. The insight is our opinions. So we might have several different ideas or different assertions of why, what might be the cause or what might be the effect of this. And that's fine. We can have lots of different ideas. We can have opposing ideas. Our job isn't to be right. Our, our job is to find out what is right. Okay. And it may be that we have other evidence that supports one of these ideas more than the other, or we maybe we need to go out and find that evidence. Maybe that'd be part of the next step of recommendations. But just like fact, it should be short enough to be read in a few seconds, have enough context to be sh understood by itself. Because remember, this isn't going to be shown necessarily in a report or in, a, um, in the experiment. This may be held separately and it needs to be reusable. 
as much as possible. And therefore, it wants really clearly to find relevance. You know, what is this insight relevant to? Particularly if you're working on a prototype, it's really useful to say what well, this is um, uh, an insight that's based on version X, blah, 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 or this is a, an insight that's from a prototype. It's not at the actual live website. And we might find that that depends on how tactical or how much of a principal insight it is. And what I mean by that is a principal insight tends to have relevance to as, as wide audience as possible, maybe even to the whole organization. A more strategic insight has a fairly wide uh, remit, but it's more helping us understand a subject. Um, whereas tactical may only be uh, relevant for that specific context at that specific time or that particular feature, or maybe even that just that prototype. So insight taxonomy um, classifications should have context, type, and the theme. So one of the ones I really like to have is type. And what I mean by that is principal uh, insights, strategic insights, tactical, prototype, assertion, obsolete, these are also good ones. So a principal is something that likely affects every part of our organization. Whereas a strategic insight may be specific to a particular team or feature, but guides our strategic thinking. A tactical insight is likely to be very specific to just that part of the experience, such as a position of a button. Um, but I also think it's important to make it clear when the insight is specific to a prototype. This may not be something that's actually even on the live website. So we might also want to make it clear that this insight is an assertion or a hypothesis. What I mean by that is sometimes rather than starting from the evidence and working through to facts, insights, and recommendations, we might actually start with an idea and look backwards to see if we have any evidence for it. So if it's uh, actionable, we'd want that to be a hypothesis as a, um, as a recommendation. So if we say, I think we should create a new feature, that's a recommendation as a hypothesis. If someone says, I believe our customers prefer green clothing to any other colors, that's an assertion. But we can we can have that assertion as an insight and a market as such, and then look to see have we got any evidence to see if that's true. Also, we might want obsolete. So for especially for tactical insights, if we say the button's in the wrong place and then we move that button, that insight's now obsolete, right? Or completed. So finally, recommendations. A recommendation looks complicated because it's got five different parts, but it's really quite simple. And not necessarily all parts are always necessary for every recommendation. So we have action, context, audience, benefits, and measurement. So let's just work through that. So in this example, we've got the action, move the customer invoice history to profile settings and the context from the footer, the audience, so that customers benefit, can find, uh, find them better, which will measurement reduce calls to the contact center. So that would make a really good recommendation. We've covered off what we need to do. We've helped people understand uh, why we need to do it and what is the current situation. We've explained what's the benefit and also how we can measure that benefit so we can make sure we test that and we create an experiment and we come back around. You know, when we put that change in, we need to see has there been a drop off of um, support calls to the contact center about invoicing. So like all three of the ones I mentioned before, these need to have enough context to be understood by themselves, uh, connected to relevant evidence, both for and against. You know, it's it may be if you really want someone to undertake this recommendation, it's be easy just to miss off that inconvenient bit of, uh, of data that kind of goes against it. But it's our job to give a really good balance view of like, right, this is why we think we should do this. But these are also reasons we might not or considerations uh, if we do do this. A recommendation should be retestable and measurable as much as possible. I very rarely see an example where that isn't the case. And then when it comes to taxonomy, we want to give some idea of priority, ease and status. So let's talk through um, taxonomy. So classifications uh, should provide context status and prioritization so let's, status here's a few examples so like unactioned we've got a recommendation here and it's waiting for someone to make a decision now they may make a decision that there isn't enough evidence we need more evidence so that would go back to research um, to work on they may look at that evidence and go mm, no i'm not happy with this let's reject it or they might approve it and once it's approved then it needs to be picked up by someone to actually do uh, an action um, and then 
when that's finished, that would be completed. Once it's completed, we need to retest it. And just like with uh, insights where we had assertions, we might also want the mark of hypothesis to say this, we started with this idea and we're looking for evidence to support or disprove this idea. And I think that's worth doing. It's not an idea that's come out of evidence. It's one that we're looking for evidence for. Now the priority and uh, context, these were ones that would be very specific to your organization, but things that are quite useful uh, impact, the confidence we have in it, the ease and effort it's gonna take to actually do that. Unlike with uh, experiments where we might have marked it with team to say, this is the team that undertook that experiment. In this case, we might say, this is the team that we expect to pick up this recommendation and take it forward. Going back to that obsolete tag for insights, people often ask, this recommendation has been completed or this insight is in relation to something that's been changed, so is obsolete, should I delete it? And my answer is always no. We should never delete anything. Our repository should be a record of what we know, how we are thinking or were thinking and what we did. So if we delete anything, we, we lose that provenance and it will cause people to have to relearn and make the same mistakes. And if something is no longer current, we can just mark it as complete or obsolete or some kind, some kind of uh, tag like that, just to make it clear that this isn't still relevant. So the only exception to this, I think, is if maybe we have some data we find out is based, say, on an experiment that failed, or, you know, let's say we ran an A-B test and we found there was a bug, like that example we looked at earlier in Italy. If that if that A-B test was poorly translated or was a bug in a test, then we can wipe that because that's no longer a fact. So we can just get rid of that. So what about an old um, research from a report um, or legacy information? Now, it'd be great to have all of that in your repository, but do we have to go through all our old reports and reformat it into Atomic? Well, I mean, that would be great. And if we could do that, we probably should. But in reality, it's a lot of work and it's probably gonna be a barrier to getting your repository off the ground. I remember, you know, we, we, want, we were saying before that it's better that research is there at all than in a perfect state. Quantity is more important than quality when it comes to a repository. So one trick I've seen that um, I've seen used successfully, it's kind of like a shortcut, uh, perhaps using an experiment as a container for legacy research. And what we can do is actually add each report as a fact and make sure it's well tagged and discoverable. Um, and if possible, extract the key insights and link those back to the fact as a source. So if someone finds a study that was particularly useful, um, to what they're working on. That might be the trigger for them to properly extract the facts into a dedicated experiment. And then this way, the most useful research actually gets brought into your repository via osmosis. So let's talk about evidence score. Um, you may have noticed that some of the screenshots or um, when I was showing you the Gloomy system earlier, we have some numbers, some data of uh, evidence score or knowledge score. So basically what this means is that uh, it's simply the cumulative score of all the evidence. Each fact is worth one, plus one or minus one, depending on whether it proves or disproves, and that results in an evidence score. And I need to be really clear that this is just a rough idea of how well we know something, of how much evidence we have for something. This should not be making decisions for us. It's not a truth score or a, a relevant score. It doesn't tell, him how, uh, tell us how important something is, just how much evidence we have for something. Sometimes we need a lot of evidence to make a decision, um, but for some things like bugs or uh, something like that, the likelihood is we, we really don't need much evidence before uh, before we we get uh, we get it sorted. So the likelihood is something really important never gets a chance for a really high score before it's sorted out. That said, I often see a correlation between an insight with a high evidence score and a principal insight. Uh, just simply because it affects every part of the organization, it's probably going to have a lot of evidence behind it. And the evidence score can come in really useful when we need to move quickly. So if, um, if someone says, right, we've got a client coming in tomorrow, uh, the boss is on the way, I need a wireframe right now. I might not have time to do um, any research or read loads of reports, but I still want to try and design with as much evidence as possible. So I can go into my repository and say, right, what do we know about this certain subject? Grab insights with a certain level of confidence. And those insights with a low score, I can ignore them um, entirely, or I can use them with the knowledge that there may not be enough uh, evidence to really um, support this properly. 
And that evidence may not be contextually relevant for my particular product or department or what I'm working on, my focus. So that would, that will kind of be an asterisk. It would be a, a pin to say, well, I need to retest these uh, and make sure that this evidence, these insights are actually true for what I'm working on. So with that in mind, the evidence score is something not to worry about too much. Um, it's it's useful and it, it can give a, a quick indication to how much evidence there is, but it isn't, um, it isn't a decision maker and be careful of treating as such. So the most difficult thing with this approach, especially when trying to build a repository is getting engagement. And of course, engagement in repository is really key if people aren't using it and information isn't being stored in the same place. Um, it, that almost kind of encouraged less engagement. And I think this is something to think about, especially if you're working with uh, non-researchers and they're going to be a big part of the input into repository. Um, well, I actually did um, some uh, a, a, quite a lot of research on this last year and we found some really interesting things. So what were the reasons uh, some organizations were struggling to get engagement from people? So the first one is probably obvious, which is, you know, um, non-researchers that are doing research, they've got other jobs to be doing. They're busy, they're learning this so they can do what they need to do. They've got the information, they just want to get on and do it. And they don't really have time or see the benefit in stopping and pausing and um, bringing that in. So one of the real positives of the atomic process is because it's built into the synthesis process. Um, if they're using it, they hopefully will find it as a useful uh, part of the research process and also then the recording and putting into a centralized repository has been done already that's already been achieved the second is that there can be a lot of fear about starting a, a new process or learning a new process and, and learning a new product so that has to be taken in consideration but the final thing which was the most of a surprise for me it shouldn't have been but it was the biggest surprise and the one that it's probably the biggest factor is we're asking people to put all of their research in a public place. Now it might only be public within the organization, but we're always telling people how difficult our jobs are. Research is so complicated and we should get paid lots of money for doing it. And they were saying, but you know, put your research in front of all your colleagues so everyone can see it. So a lot of people were finding that they were just nervous about putting their work in, a, in a, an arena where other people are going to see it. Now, luckily, this is actually one of the easiest ones to, to address. And it was solved by addressing it just simply by saying, look, you guys, this might be uh, quite overwhelming and unnerving for you. And that's fine. That's natural. And uh, that's fine. Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you're feeling that or you're struggling with that, come and speak to us and, and we'll help you with it and maybe give you some confidence or some tips on how to improve the the research if you're not sure. So one thing I didn't really understand when I started this is that I was thinking of this as a UX problem, as a UX thing. It's a UX repository, a UX process, it's UX research. But it isn't, it's just knowledge. And very quickly I came to realize that um, UX knowledge is just knowledge and other people's knowledge is just as useful. And this process works as much for, um, for anyone in the organization as it does for, for user researchers. So where, where it's, it's true that almost all teams, the vast majority of teams, at least I speak to are UX professionals and, and normally the ones that are in charge or the most interested in, in creating a knowledge management process and system. It is something that should be inclusive of everybody in the organization and outside in some ways as well. Actually, one of the most common problems that customers I speak to are trying to solve is de-siloing knowledge and breaking down the barriers between departments and disciplines and bring all of that knowledge together. And this process does work for any kind of knowledge. I mentioned earlier that the weirdest um, organization we worked with was a murder investigation team. And uh, so that is, I can't say the name of the organization, but they're studying murders. And the 
the problem they have is in a murder, you have all sorts of types of evidence from physical um, crime scene uh, information to more um, qualitative interview research to uh, data on people's mobile phones and you know kind of the secret spies we have in our in our living rooms and our spaces so they've got all of these different points of data they need to bring together to try and work out who done it <laughs> and the the atomic process really helps with that being completely agnostic on where that information is coming from and be able to bring it together to help us build a picture of actually what is the truth and not being tunnel visioned on the method uh, and the methodology or the source of the data From the beginning, the point that we overestimate was how important scoring the knowledge was. And as I mentioned about the, the knowledge score, it's something that can be useful, but uh, it's very easy to get super focused or hyper focused on the evidence score uh, in an unhealthy way. And actually at Gleaning, we, we developed a process. So at the moment, the score is just every fact is worth one, either plus one or minus one, whether it supports or disproves uh, the insight or recommendation. But we actually developed like an algorithm that balanced and weighted different um, types of research. Um, it also uh, balanced how old the evidence was. And it was fantastic. It was really effective. Um, it was too effective. So people got really focused on making sure that score was was perfect. And even worse, people started making decisions based on that score. And that was wrong. So we had to make the difficult decision to roll that out and uh, remove it from, from the software. So we massively overscored. We spent a lot of time and wasted a lot of time um, trying to get this perfect scoring of knowledge <laughs> which just wasn't helpful it's all contextual i must use the word context a million times a day right a research repository is about context it's about delivering the context and delivering the information to the stakeholder so that person can make decisions with understanding the context yeah we have this evidence but it's come from a different product or um we have this evidence and it's relevant and contextually perfect for this thing, but it's quite old, maybe we need to retest it. So it's having that balance of context all times. Yeah, one of the most interesting case studies was actually with one of the first organizations I worked with outside of that original organization where we developed this process. And I went there particularly to um, help them with their knowledge uh, management and trying this process in quite a large company. And at the beginning, we um, started collecting together uh, lots of different projects and breaking them down. And, and uh, because of the way that Atomic is, is networked, it was very quickly clear that there was a pattern emerging. One particular pattern of a problem that was coming up in maybe one in every three or four different experiments kept on bringing the same issue up. And when we um, we took that to the team that was actually affected by it. So the people who were doing the research weren't studying this thing. They weren't in the team affected by this thing. They were just recording that. So this is a tip as well. You know, um, just because it's not the thing you're recording, still record it, still um, keep that in your repository because it's probably going to help someone else. Right. Um, it's that quantity rather than quality thing. So we had all of these, we had this mounting evidence that there was a problem there. It didn't seem like a particularly serious issue. It seemed like quite an easy one to fix, but we thought we'd better make sure that team is aware of it. And they went, oh, right, yeah, we really need to get that sorted because this will stop us being able to go into our main trading period of the year. And that trading period was worth about 70% of that company's revenue just over a month or two. And they said, yeah, it's really easy to fix. They had two months to fix it. I think they fixed it in two weeks. But they said, if we hadn't caught that issue, we would have gone into our biggest trading period, not been able to actually properly trade, and it probably would have put the company under. So I'm really proud to say on the first outing um, for Atomic Research, it literally saved uh, a company that had been around for years, a British institution, from going under. <laughs> So thank you so much for listening to me today. And I think if I was to leave you with some final words, it's to remember this is just a framework. Use it, twist it, mold it, make it 
fit your organization. But most of all, remember, as we started with, that uh, research repositories are not for researchers. We're providing a service for the people that need to make decisions. They're the end users. And research repositories are for decision makers. Whatever we do, no matter how thorough our research, how perfect our coding, none of it is of any value if it doesn't help those that need it. And this is why I'm so passionate about knowledge management, sharing information, making that information digestible and helping people make better decisions. Mm -hmm.